So Ken, how do we uh, recognize we're out in this landscape where we might find these uh, salt affected soils? Well, first of all, if you look at the topography, they tend to develop in these basin or depression areas. So if we look back from where we walk from, we can see the grassland there, the sagebrush and the blue bunch wheatgrass. That's a turnozemic soil. And then when we drop down into here, we find this giant wild rye. This plant here is, is a, a salt tolerant plant and it indicates you do have salts in the soils. So that would be my first indicator is this particular plant in this environment. We have smaller plants that we'll see on the ground. We have this foxtail barley that we can see. That also will grow on saline uh, sites. And then there's a few other species, uh, Disticulus stricta or salt grass, which grows in saline sites. And then this red plant, this pickleweed, as some people call it, or I call it red glasswort, uh, it will show up bright red in the fall around these ponds as they dry out. So vegetation and the topographic position are the main things that one would look for for finding these soils. And then, of course, as they dry out, you'll see the actual salt crusting on the surface around the ponds. And if this scene uh, site was dry in the fall here, this is all white all through here. You can see the salts very quite clearly. Salt affected soils are a serious issue globally and, and certainly across much of Western Canada. These uh, soils develop naturally and we've also seen salinity of developing as a result of management. We're on an interesting site here near the city of Kamloops, uh, British Columbia, and we're going to ask Kent here to talk about this particular site and some of the factors that have led to the salt issues and salt impacts in this soil. We're on a very dry grassland site here. The climate is um, very dry, semi-arid here, and the climate is one of the key factors in the development of saline soils. So we get about 35 centimeters a year. Uh, and because of the dry environment, uh, salts can accumulate in the soils. There's not enough moisture to wash them out of the system. Where we're sitting now is in a depression. It's a small lake bed that developed after the glaciers left. And clays washed into this basin to begin with and built up in the profile. And then over time, salts were leached by groundwater into this area here downslope. Now there's no outlet stream to wash the salts out, so they accumulate here over time and build up. In the interior of British Columbia here, most of our saline soils develop in a pond system. In the prairies, they tend to develop differently. Uh, soil or salts are drawn upwards through the soil profile by evaporation of water. Here they collect in a pond as the uh, subsurface water has carried the salts in. Kent, could you talk to us a bit about the processes that are involved in a, a soil in a salt affected site like this? There are um, a number of different salts that develop in these soils. Uh, there's calcium, magnesium, and specifically sodium. And sodium is the problem. Sodium is a, a positive ion that disperses uh, soil particles. If you have lots of calcium in the soil, the, the soil will, will drain quite well. When you have sodium, it just turns it into a, a, a blocked off mass, I guess, and water cannot drain into these, into these soils. The sodium also um, has an effect in the soil structure that, uh, that develops in, in these particular environments. This particular soil here is in the young stage of development. Uh, we don't have uh, a well-developed solenetic soil here, but an early stage developing one. Let's uh, take a closer look at this uh, soil profile here, Kent, and see what we can learn about the soil from uh, the uh, profile phase. This soil profile is um, quite wet at this time of year, and we have three main horizons that have developed. The surface horizon is this dark one here. It's the AH, and it becomes fairly thin up here and then picks up again down here, and it follows if I can sort of draw, if you see the way the knife is going here, you're seeing stops there. But you can see that there's sort of a, a wavy boundary between the AH and the horizon below. Now, there's also salt in the A horizon, so it would be classified as an AHS, little s for the salt, H for humus. Salt concentration, you can actually see it here. It's dried out a little bit, so we can see the salts precipitating on the surface of the profile. And that salt accumulation goes down to somewhere maybe in about here. 
as this soil dries out, we will get columnar structure developing in the profile. And there is a crack developing right here where this will actually form columns. So this horizon down here is called a BN, and the letter N is used to signify salt in the soil. Sometimes you'll also have clay movement from above down into here, and you'll have a BNT, or a clay-rich uh, salt horizon. The letter T is used to indicate uh, clay concentrations. And below that, down here, we're getting a salt enriched horizon, we call that a CS, and the little s stands for salts as well. Sometimes in these soils you will get a horizon down here which is about 10 centimeters thick or more which is concentrated salt, and that would be a, a CSA, and that indicates that you have a, a actual layer of salt that's accumulated in the profile. That has not developed here. So in recapping we have an AHS, a BN, and then a CS horizon in this profile. These soils are gonna look quite different uh, if we're here later on in the summer. Um, I see you have some, uh, some soils that are dried out. Let's, let's have a look at what it might look like um, later on. Okay. This is a, a ped that I actually dug out a few days ago. And this here is the AHS horizon, the black one on the top. And then this is the BN going down to here. You can see that it has a distinct columnar structure to it. Um, sometimes we have flat tops and sometimes we have rounded tops. Um, on these, this is a rounded top, so it's columnar. If it was flat, it would be prismatic. But this is a characteristic structure that you find in these soils. So there's the structure, this nice column. And as this profile dries out, it's going to develop more and more of these. We'll see them develop quite well. Now I've allowed this soil to dry for about a week. And what you're seeing on the surface here are gypsum crystals, calcium sulfate. And these will actually grow as the profile dries. You can identify gypsum crystals by looking at their structure. They form very, very fine needles. And even with your naked eye, you can see these little needle crystals. So when you see these needle-like crystals in the soil, you know you have gypsum as part of the um, soil profile. I have tested this soil with 10% with, uh, hydrochloric acid. There is no fizzing, which would indicate that there's calcium carbonate. So there's no calcium carbonate. The carbonate is bound up with the, the sulfur to form, form this gypsum complex. So, so that's a nice example of the AHS on the top, the blacker area and then the BN horizon with the gypsum crystals starting to develop on it. This ped here was dug out a year or so ago and has been allowed to dry and the AHS, you can see the blackness here, so this is my AHS and this is my BN. Now part of the BN is broken off but this ped was about this long before it broke off. And I've let this dry out for a good year, so you can clearly see the salts developing and precipitating on the surface of the ped. But again, another example of these columnar structures that develop in these soils. Now, when these soils are moist, as we have here, this clay is very plastic, it's very malleable. But when it dries out, it becomes extremely hard. And then finally, We have a few samples of the CS horizon and they have dried out as well and again you can see that the salts are precipitating out in the surface. So one key thing when if you're working in environments like this and if you're not sure if you're dealing with a saline soil and it's moist when you dig the pit, let the peds dry out so you can see the salts actually precipitating and that'll give you some answers. And then you can also do chemical analysis on these soils to find out what salt concentrations you have. So those are the, the peds and the structure as it will appear and as the soil dries out over the season. It's always interesting to think about the effects of soils on human activities, whether they be for agriculture or urban land use or forestry. Kent, could you talk about, first of all, I guess this particular site, but then generalize to uh, solanetsic soils, general. 
Yes, Art, this um, site is quite localized here, but I believe it's within the city limits. If this was developed for housing and this material wasn't removed from here, the salts are very corrosive. So if they had any kind of metal piping, for example, that could be corroded. Any concrete work, uh, that could be corroded and um, damaged as well. So special management practice would have to take place in this particular area. Whether they fill it in or they dig it out is, is um, up to them, I guess. Um, the problem with the salt soils is that the salts actually draw moisture out of plant roots and that's why only certain plants can survive in these sites. Kent, let's uh, transport ourselves to the Canadian prairies and uh, think about this type of soil where we're trying to grow grain crops, wheat, barley, canola, and so on. Um, you talked about salts as uh, limiting water availability. What about the physical properties of this soil and its effect on crops' ability to get water? Uh, in the prairies, uh, where there's lots of agriculture, wheat, barley, all kinds of different crops, saline soils are problematic in that the salts there are being drawn up from lower depths and get up into the root zone and the, and the plants cannot survive. The solanetic soils will have a, a deeper AH horizon than we're seeing here. Uh, the roots will go down through that maybe 10, maybe to 15 centimeters and then they're restricted. They can't get down to any moisture that's deeper in the soil. On a chernozemic soil, let's say a black chernozem or a dark brown chernozem, the roots can go down much deeper because there's no restriction due to the salts. So you're going to get better crop production on the chernozemic soils and poorer crop production on the on the solanetic soils uh, for that reason. It's just the rooting depth and mm -hmm. it can't access the moisture. And as you know, in the prairies, it's fairly dry, so the moisture is really limiting there for crop growth. Okay, so when we think about these types of soils, we have impacts that are a result of the, uh, the chemistry, the, the salts, the type of salts, and also the physical properties and how they interact. That's correct. Mm -hmm. So both work together to produce negative effects, I guess, if you want to say it mm -hmm. that way, on crop production. And part of the other problem that's occurring there is with the agriculture systems we're using and fallow fields, for example, when the soils dry out, even if it doesn't have salt near the surface, the soils, the salts will draw up by capillary attraction, mm -hmm. and the salts then move up into the surface zones. And, and so we're creating a lot of salt soils or saline soils in the prairies via that process as well. So for agriculture purposes, um, there's not a whole lot you can do. One management practice can be carried out and that's uh, by uh, plowing the field you have to irrigate it and add gypsum to remove the salts out of the out of the soil but that's an expensive uh, process and uh, you need lots of water to be able to to reclaim these soils so part of our problem in management and agriculture when you do get a saline system developed it's very very difficult to reverse the process so for agriculture in the prairies it's problematic